would like to, as I said, so New York break now, and I would like to start with uh, Jake uh, Barton from uh, Local Project. He's director of Local Project. He won the U.S. National Design Award. He will be awarded by uh, President Obama in September at the White House. And so it's a rehearsal that we are doing now with, uh, with Jake. So congratulations, Jake. And uh, he's also partner of Frangetti and very much uh, involved in all uh, in many museum projects and doing uh, many great things for public spaces. And uh, he just did uh, amazing uh, uh, application and um, uh, technology for the 9-11 project and the Cleveland Museum. So, Jake Burton, thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's an amazing conference filled with so many people doing amazing things. So I'm really glad to be the last uh, speaker before Arthur wraps everything up. Uh, on the theme of creativity, I think that uh, when we think about creativity, I often think about improvisation. And it's often in, in conflict with the idea of technology and also structure. So I want to talk about the ways in which when you think about creativity and you look at artists, you often think of it as a relationship. You're making something and that thing is feeding back information to you. Right? And so if you think about this famous film of Jackson Pollock, which actually was a large reason why he actually uh, became uh, understood as an artist, which led to incredible fame, it really was about this relationship between the work that you're making and what you're doing. Right? And if you think about all these different art forms, if you think about uh, visual arts, if you think about sculpture, if you think about performance, uh, and also about comedy, you think about improvisation. This is a, an American comedian, Tina Fey, who's here devouring brownie husband. Uh, she has three rules uh, that apply to improvisational comedy, but I think it's actually really good for all of us who work creatively. So I want to share these just to begin with. The first is start with yes. Right? When you're actually in a relationship making comedy together, the first thing to do is always say yes to other things that other people are saying and to build on them. Right. And the second is to make statements, and this is really important, meaning you don't just open a meeting or you don't just open a scene by saying, where are we or how would this work? You say something constructive, people might disagree, and you might get into different avenues, but, but leaving things amorphous is actually not very helpful when you're being creative. It's important to like, start strong and to move into dire different directions together. And then this is really important for all of us working in any type of institution. Mistakes, places where there are problems, places where there are issues, those are opportunities for change. So that's really, really important to remember, right? A crisis in an institution is actually one of the best moments for reinvention and for recreation. But I, one thing that I'm interested in, in general, and I want to talk about this throughout the, the talk, is actually not just personal ways to be creative, but ways for overall structures, uh, for groups to be creative, right? So uh, if you think about improvisational jazz, uh, you get into... Uh, a situation where the structures themselves, the, the motifs, the musical structures that people are playing, are actually ways in which people can create creatively. Right? So if you think about, uh, just to play this, this is My Favorite Things by John Coltrane. Right? So he's taking this motif and he plays it over and over again in very, very different ways. And so I want to talk about ways in which we can take that structure of improvisation and apply it to the work that we're actually doing itself. So I'm just going to show three projects today. Uh, and the first one uh, is about sight. Uh, and this is an in engagement that we did for the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is a large encyclopedic museum. It has one of the most amazing uh, collections and is one of the most esteemed museums in America. And Gallery One is an engagement that is part of this huge uh, $350 million expansion of the museum's galleries but it was looking to expand the audiences for the museum itself, particularly through technology. And so these are some of the final shots, but this image is the first inspiration shot that we created for the museum. And the idea was to actually pull the technology away from the artworks, lower them so you can see the artworks over them, and make everything inside the technology about what you're looking at. These are all very subtle design choices, but it's really important to us to actually create these galleries in ways that are traditional, familiar, in ways that don't call attention to the technology as a special gizmo or a new flashy thing that's going to distract from the art, but something that actually augments the art experience itself. 
And this is critical, I think, in terms of how we imagine technology working, because it, it shouldn't uh, and it doesn't have to be a distraction or a replacement. It should be, again, something that heightens your experience and your relationship with the artworks themselves. So when you actually select any individual artwork, it immediately shows you the context where that artwork was originally placed. And then it allows you to actually manipulate the artworks themselves and to ask and answer different questions about information and stories on the artworks, right? I, I love the idea of that context. It's very, very simple. But just to show you a couple other ones, right? Like this piece from 1300 BC, you'd never know that it's actually from there in the gallery context itself, right? Or if you look at this individual piece, like suddenly these pieces that are so bold make so much more sense because you see them in their original context. Or I love how this piece, this is made for this castle, right? So amazing to see actually where it came from. And these are very, very simple ways. It's not interpretive, it's not a label. This is Rodin's original studio where that piece was cast. So it becomes this huge factory for human expression. Or even in these cases where we don't have the original piece, right? like only a moment like that could create that artwork. <laughs> and so suddenly the, the relationship with the artworks is, is so much deeper and richer and again, is not meant to distract. In this case, it's a far more interesting way of actually looking uh, at the idea of empathy, of connecting with these artworks. What you're looking at is an algorithm that's using facial detection. So as you're making different faces, it's connecting and bringing forth different artworks from the collection itself. <laughs> and so this kind of changes the nature of an art museum, right? Suddenly, it's a performative space. Suddenly it's a communal space. It's a space where people can sort of gather around and make all of these different connections themselves. And then as people are actually making these contacts, these pairs, they're actually creating a record that you can email to yourself at home. And that actually sends you information about the artwork or a place to go see the artwork inside the museum itself. So a lot of our work is about stretching out the museum exhibit both before and then during and then after to create this long-term <laughs> persistent relationship with museums themselves. This is a piece that allows people to draw and as they're drawing, objects from the collection that are, have the same shapes come forth. Right, so this idea that someone was saying in the interview before that people should be creative when they're inside the museum, this is a place that reminds us that in fact Everything in that museum was drawn by a human, was drawn by a person. And you yourself can be creative inside the museum itself. In this case, what you see is something that we made for children, but it was actually so addictive for the curators, we made one for adults. <laughs> but the adult one has lots of information, because apparently people like information. That's at least what I've been told. <laughs> this is a piece uh, based, again, on this medieval tapestry. This tapestry tells the Medusa myth. So this core story about Perseus. And the piece embodies this idea that these are epic stories that get told over and over again, every generation. And so what you do is you learn about the different chapters in the tapestry, and then you create your own comic book out of that same story that you can send to yourself. You can make different dialogue, you can change different parts of it, but this idea of remixing artworks inside the gallery as a way to look again at the artworks underscores this idea that these are stories that get told over and over and over again. We have another one that deals with Adam and Eve. It's a story that gets told over and over again. This piece uh, is in probably the, the sort of cornerstone of the overall project is a piece we call the Collections Wall. Uh, and this is the original inspiration shot that we developed for it. And with this I wanted to talk a little bit again about the idea of improvisation. Because one of the challenging things when you deal with technology is how to get to the best idea as fast as possible, right? And in just in creativity in general, it's one of the big challenges. So this was one of the first concept designs that we created. It was meant to be a visualization of all the artworks from the entire collection that are on display. So 3,000 artworks, all that are on display within the museum. And we were really interested in the ways in which you could basically select individual pieces and see them expand. But we got very nervous about the structure of how it would work. And so we went from that original view, and then we thought about this, in which case the different artworks would be moving from left to right. And then we had a visualization based on that. And then we thought that would be maybe a little bit confusing, so we moved on to another idea, uh, which was this one, in which case it was a much more of a gridded pattern, and you'd have different sections 
based on different parts of the collection. And so you can see here actually a, a team that's struggling with an idea all in the abstraction, meaning all on paper. And it wasn't until we did this, which is an early, early prototype of the software that we could solve all of the core interaction and design problems from the wall. And what my argument is here, and this is one of the main lessons I want to impart, is this idea of prototyping, of learning and of creating through making rather than just planning and talking about. Because we actually solved problems in literally 20 minutes that we had struggled with for six months. And that's because we actually saw it in front of us. And from there, we started iteratively improving and changing the designs over and over again, again through prototyping, so being able to see it in full scale. This, I think, is a really critical differentiation between physical design, meaning architecture or exhibitions, and software. When you make a physical design, when you make a building, you build it once, and if you make a mistake, you have to live with it, or you change it at great expense. When you design digitally, you always do this idea of iterative prototyping. You build an alpha design, and then a beta design, and then you release that, and you watch how people use your software, and you improve on it. Right? These are two very different paradigms or ways of making design work. And what we're doing is basically taking digital design and applying it into physical space. Right? So this is one prototype after another, and that's basically how we fix things. So when we look at prototyping, there's basically three things that we look for that I want to share with you. Uh, the first, not surprisingly, is this idea of magic. Right? So you've probably heard there's a quote about technology, which is uh, a good piece of technology is indistinguishable from magic. It feels as if people are making things appear out of thin air. And so, yes, we, we really look for those magical moments themselves. But also important is this idea that innovation needs to have a point. It can't just be innovation for innovation's sake. It can't be just techno-magic with no story, with no emotion. I often say that there's no LCD screen that's thin enough that it won't look like a toaster oven in two years. Right? And that's because it's always going to be thinner and thinner and thinner and brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger. Right? So if you're just looking for a piece of hardware or a big screen or a fancy touch screen or a new interaction idea to create interest for your visitors, you're not making a good investment because it will age very badly. Right? And that brings me to the third idea that we often look for, which is experiential learning. So the things that we're interested in with technology is really the idea that you can actually learn things by experiencing them. And that's one thing that museums do exceptionally well. Right? You have people in physical space, in social interaction, oftentimes with families, oftentimes intergenerational, oftentimes with real, authentic artifacts. This is an experience. This is not a book. This is not a movie. This is not something that's uh, divorced from reality. This is a real moment. And what we're interested in doing is taking the ideas or messages of a museum and turning them into experiences, things that people can participate, things that people can make. And so over and over again, when we're looking at these different pieces, like this is a prototype uh, literally from a month before we actually opened. You can see it here, where we were basically seeing how the curators themselves were working with the actual technology. And the amazing thing is, and you'll see this in a sec when I show the final piece, it didn't look like this. Like we made major changes all the way up to a week before we actually opened. And that's the commitment that we made to continuously improve and to watch how people actually use things, watch the mistakes they made, listen to the questions they had, and answer and change and improve. Uh, now, one thing I will say is that this is not a very efficient or easy way to work, right? If you want to be easy, do something that people have done before, because that's easy. Right? But if you want to do something new and you want it to actually work, you need to prototype and test and refine and amplify, change, enlarge the things that people like. Right? This woman here, she had a lot of trouble actually clicking on the individual pieces themselves. And so we watched her and then changed our interfaces based exactly on what she was having trouble with. Right? So here it is in its final view. It shows all 3,000 artworks at the same time. There are these different subsets. Some are thematic, like love and lust. Some are formal, like color or like circles, that show subsets of the collection. 
It uses as many people as can fit shoulder to shoulder. And what people are doing is basically looking at these little carousels, these subsets of the collection, and then connecting them to an iPad. So as you're making your way through the collection, you can grab a tour, you can grab an individual artwork. As you like it, it actually saves it to your iPad. And what you're doing is making a custom tour of the museum itself. So people are seeing this crazy cross-section of every single thing inside of the museum that they could see at that moment. And then they're actually creating their own experience. They can take a tour from the director, or from the curator, or from a guard, or from their cousin. People can use their own iPads or they can get them from the museum itself. And then as you're making your way through the museum, there's a bunch of different ways to navigate. This is an interactive map which knows exactly where you are in the museum so it can locate you and it can just tell you about artworks that surround you. You can actually take a tour or tours that you've authored. Or there's a separate piece of technology here that essentially allows you to point the iPad at individual pieces and it does image recognition and actually points things out to you about that artwork. So it's as if the curator was standing next to you pointing out different things that are important. We're midway, or just starting the scope to actually develop this for Android and for iPhones as well. But I think one of the core parts of this entire engagement, again, is to not necessarily just look at the technology to be what draws people in, but to again focus on the core aspects of emotional connection, of storytelling, of curatorial intent that the actual technology puts forth in front of visitors themselves. Right? That's actually what will allow this type of technology to age, to continue to grow with the institution, and to look new and fresh in two years, or five years, or ten years. The, the second project I want to show has to do with a very, very large scale, really arguably one of the largest uh, scales in terms of audiences, uh, and that's Times Square. This is a partnership with Bjarke Ingels, uh, the Danish architect, where we built something for Valentine's Day, this huge light sculpture that allows people to actually use their own pulse to activate this sculpture. So as more people are touching onto this individual piece itself, the sculpture itself flashes and flashes more and more the more people that are connected one to the next. One of the things uh, that I saw in this, here I'll, I'll play this clip for you, but it kind of demonstrates the way in which you have all these different people actually using it at the same time and what that's like to design for. So, oh, it flares. It says more people, more love. Do you guys? We feel love. Oh, look at that, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, that's embarrassing, right? I make interactives for dogs, so there it is, I admit it. But I mean, what you see here is that when you make something for a place like Times Square, it actually needs to work for dogs, right? It needs to be that simple that anybody, anybody, anybody can use it. And that's actually a design challenge, and it's something that all of us, I think, struggle with, which is how do you make these things simple and engaging and emotional? And that is really, really hard to do. But I think what you see here is that you actually simplify it down to some of the core elements, and even in a place like Times Square, it can be this satisfying, engaging moment. And so those learnings then come together into this engagement. And so this is the last thing I'll show you. This is uh, a, just a small subset of our work uh, for the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Because it has some of the, the trickiness and the challenges of a museum, but it really is a huge stage in a really varied one, if you think about the audience being very, very local, uh, also very regional, and also national and international. So we were half of the team that did the master plan for the original museum, then designed all the exhibitions, and now we're producing all of the media itself. This is the museum still under construction, and it opens early next year. We also did all of the media for the memorial, which opened in 2011, and that's a, a separate engagement uh, that I won't show. But the key, I think, to the museum itself, and you can see it even in this shot, is the way in which it has this rawness to it, this authenticity. It's essentially an archaeological space filled uh, itself with the biggest artifact, which is the space. This is the original uh, wall that made up the sides of the original foundations from the buildings that literally held back the Hudson River for a full year after 9-11 itself. It's the biggest artifact, obviously, in the entire museum. 
And that sense of how to be authentic, how to be real in a way that matches the site was our biggest challenge. Because if you think about the museum, you have really on the edges two extreme forms of audience. On the one hand, you have survivors. You have people who literally ran out of the burning building for their life and know more about the event than any curator or historian ever could. And then on the other hand, you have 16-year-olds or 15-year-olds. You have young adults, people who don't remember anything from the day, may not actually know anything about the day itself. And so how you build an experience that can talk to both with any sense of authority is a huge challenge. And so our original uh, pitch and approach for the project was essentially to use the stories from one group to educate the other group. So the first thing we did was launch a project called Make History on the eighth anniversary. Worldwide call for stories, for photos, for videos of people's experiences on 9-11. And that sat together with this piece, which is a story booth just adjacent to the actual site itself, where you locate yourself on a world map. It's in six different languages. It invites anybody to tell their own 9-11 story. And then you put those two things together, and suddenly you get a sense of what the actual museum might be like. Because the museum is actually made up of all these individual stories. So when you go into the museum itself, when it opens next year, this is a rendering of the first hall called We Remember. And the first voice you hear isn't a historian, it's not a curator, it's actually other visitors talking about their experiences on that day. So I'm gonna go ahead and play a short clip which actually has a prototype of the idea itself and you'll get a sense of actually what it's gonna be like. September 11th, September 11th, September 11th, September 11th, September 11th, I was in Honolulu, Hawaii. I was in Cairo, Egypt. In Rue des Champs Élysées, à Paris. In college at UC Berkeley. I was in Times Square. To São Paulo, Brazil. I was in Miami, Florida. 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 It was probably about 11 o'clock at night. I was driving to work at 5.45 local time in the morning. We were actually in a meeting when someone barged in and said, Oh my God, my plane has just crashed the into the train train Frantically get to a radio. When I heard it over the radio, I heard it on the radio. I, the radio. I got a call from my father. The phone rang, woke me up. My business partner told me to turn on the television. So I switched on the television. All channels in Italy were displaying the same thing. The Twin Towers. And so if you imagine a project like this, very, very controversial, incredibly political, incredibly challenging, this is not a conventional idea. And the way that we were actually able to move this through the project was through prototyping, was through engaging our stakeholders, engaging our curators, engaging the broader community, and rallying them behind this idea by allowing them to experience it. That's actually what allows people to mitigate risk, to lower the risk, and to feel comfortable taking chances on new ideas. It's not by uh, being nervous and crossing your fingers, it's by testing, by prototyping, by making. When you actually move through that space, here's the large space with the actual slurry wall itself. And the actual museum itself is filled with these different audio chambers with all of these different stories. So these are stories mapped onto the original towers themselves of people's experiences inside of the towers and the escape route. And then we actually project stories onto original pieces of steel from the original towers themselves. Again, these ideas were done through prototyping. So this is the original airplane hangar that was filled with steel that the museum was holding. And we went to this place, having talked to the museum about this idea, we want to project onto these pieces of steel, and we got them to sit and to watch, and not surprisingly, they actually thought this was a terrible idea. And they told us, they said, this is a bad idea. We said, we want to test it, we want to just show it to you. So we're gonna actually set up a little mock-up and that we had built up enough trust that they came and looked at it. And when they saw this, these are the actual photos from the mock-up. The museum director herself said, you know, I never thought I would say this, but it, it really feels like the memories from that steel are coming forth. It really feels like suddenly you're seeing this artifact in a whole new way. It makes all this more sense. And it wasn't until, again, she experienced it that she had a sense of that. The last thing I'll show you from the museum is actually one of the final pieces. And again, to the theme of improvisation, it's a platform 
for the visitors themselves to ask and to answer questions about 9-11 itself. So if you think about the event, this question, how can a democracy balance between freedom and security, right? This is like the main question of 9-11 and given everything that's happening in the news with spying, with security, apparently both in France as well as in the US, this is a question for our age that 9-11 itself defines for all of us. And so instead of trying to answer it, the museum actually throws the question out to visitors and they answer the questions for themselves, right? How could 9-11 have happened? How did the world change after 9-11? And so there are individual story booths where people are answering those questions. And then we have displays that put visitors <coughs> next to politicians, next to actual pieces of history themselves. So a visitor will go and then you'll have Bill Clinton or you'll have W. Bush or you'll have Rudy Giuliani. And actually seeing all of these people answer the question one to the next is the exhibition ex experience. Jack, we have two more minutes. I understand things. And within that idea, what you end up seeing is people struggling with these different questions. And that actually is the message of the museum. The message is that the post 9-11 world is a place of questions and a place of struggling. This is improvisation within a museum context. It's the museum as a platform and it's the museum as a place for dialogue and debate. And with that, I will thank you so much again the ideas of being able to create a space of improvisation is really about making these structures that people can play within. And I think it's important to make the structures and then to forget them and just go ahead and play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake, for this brilliant presentation. What is your key learning? The key learning key, key is... Key teaching, key teaching. Key teaching, back. I think, is, again, to <laughs> trust people within your organization to play and to perform and to experiment and to test their experimentations as a way to lower risk. To so, test. yes, creativity is about risk, yes. but it's about making things and taking chances and testing those things and prototyping those things to build consensus that different creative ideas are worth moving forward with. Great, thank you very much. Is there any question in the audience while Arthur is going to uh, prepare his uh, presentation? Do you have any question in the audience for Jack? That was after tolerance, talent, it was really interesting to hear about technology. So that was our mm -hmm. last piece. Yes, there is uh, Jane. Do do you, can we have a microphone on uh, for Jane, please? Can yeah. you repeat the question? The question is, do we build prototyping into the budget? And the answer is yes. That's, that's the core of our, we see it as a design tool. There is and if you're, particularly with software, <laughs> you have to develop the software at some point. So if you develop it earlier and then iteratively change it, that's basically included in the cost. But you have to be committed to it and the institution needs to be committed to seeing those things and to responding to them. But I think it actually saves you money if you don't prototype. You would invest in things, they launch, they fail, everyone's unhappy. Yeah? How often do you fail? Uh, almost always. I mean, when you start these process, it's very humbling because you make stuff and then you show it to your clients or to your team and they're not good. And in fact, we have now oriented our whole process around prototyping called Prototype First. And the first major project we did for that with the Gates Foundation, we built all this stuff and they learned from the things that we built that the things they had approved, all of the approaches, half of them they didn't like anymore once they tried them. Now that, that's horrible, right? But that's not so horrible three months into a 15 month engagement. It's really horrible 13 months into a 15 month engagement. And that's when you can't change it and that's when there's really, really bad work, right? So our basic approach is that doing this lowers risk and makes it so that by the time you get to launch, you know that people are happy with it because they've actually used the actual thing. One more question, yes. Uh, it's a little bit provocative question. Uh, we found ourselves uh, that a lot of museums investing in technologies, in software development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
what do you think about the suggestion that in an ideal world, museums should not invest in technologies, they should invest in the content only and try to find the technologies somewhere outside. And in the modern world, there are a lot of free technologies. Because we see everywhere that museums invest in money in something they cannot do. They cannot develop software, they cannot develop technologies. So, suggest, so what, do, is do, do share that, what is the question? The question is, do you share that idea that in the future, museum of tomorrow will not develop technologies and will really stick to developing content? Um, yeah, I don't think that's right at all. I mean, I think that there are different things that are free, but they tend to be exceptionally generic, and they tend to not be the types of experiences that people will want to go to museums for. I mean, it's almost like saying, you know, why would a museum want an exhibition design or a catalog design or... Well, I, I can give you my example. I, I work in audio guide systems, so right. we, uh, this area, and we found two years ago in Stockholm that three museums, Wasa, Nordiska, and Skansen, they were developing their own audio guide for mobile telephones, right. which means that the user gets one museum, download application, learn it, goes to another museum, download, learn it. It makes me think that probably something's wrong here. Museums should not develop, in my case, audio right. guide systems. They should develop the content. Okay. And uh, I think it's a very important message for all museums that don't, don't go to technologies too much. <laughs> they should be, should be right, balanced. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I okay. think by that logic, so they shouldn't design their books. I mean, they should have one standard book design that they feed all their content into. It's probably all about Last question by Picasso Museum. Can we have the microphone? Uh, I wanted to know, uh, for the world, the digital, uh, how long it's important to develop a prototype? Because it's such a, um, you know, it's difficult to develop a prototype in a way that we plan for that, but we're just wondering how much... Oh, Sandrine, can you ask the question with the microphone, please? Yeah, we're just uh, asking uh, for the big wall, you present us uh, how, how much you employed to create the prototype and to test it and so on. Because we, we plan to develop such a project for the museum, but we ask ourselves many questions, time, money, and so on. Yeah, so the, that piece is the, is the first one that we've ever done. The entire engagement was two years, so we probably worked on that piece for like a year. Um, one thing that is interesting is a lot of museums have been talking to us about that piece in particular. And so you know, we're under way of thinking about it potentially as a platform that could go into lots of different museums. So that's one thing that's sort of happening is that a lot of people are seeing this as one solution that might work in a lot of different museums. Uh, and that has some interesting connotations as well. Because suddenly you might have a lot of museums that are linked together digitally, which I think is actually something that's really, really exciting. I know that uh, we're doing work on the Cooper Hewitt, which is the National Design Museum of the US. And we're in partnership, potentially, with other institutions around the world to bring their collections into the Cooper Hewitt. Very different way of thinking about a museum. If you think about a museum as a building filled with your collections, that makes perfect sense. And in the 20th century, that's all you can do. But in the 21st century, if you're a museum that's about ideas or visitor experience, and you can find other people's digital artifacts that support your curator's points or the stories, suddenly becomes like a very interesting opportunity. Uh, so that's one thing that we're, we're working on with a bunch of institutions. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming from New York yeah. for this great presentation. Thank you.